I'm Scott Tibbles with the Investing News Network, and today I'm having another chat with Remy Piet, who is the Senior Director at America's Market Intelligence. Thank you for joining me, Remy. It's my pleasure, Scott, as always. And so today we're going to revisit the story that is happening in Guyana. Remy and I have spoken previously about this uh, Caribbean country in South America. We spoke in August and then later in September. Previously, when Remy and I have talked about Guyana, we've talked about how it has the potential to be the new Qatar in energy with the major oil company ExxonMobil planning to produce 120,000 barrels of oil per day starting in 2020. Now, that's quite a lot of oil to be shaking a stick at. And Ghana is in a very interesting position in regards to its future politically. So, Remy, can you talk, talk to me a little bit about recent developments on the ground there and really what's happening with Ghana's, with the way that Ghana is tracking with first production set to be really on the horizon? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, first of all, maybe the, the, the comparison that we uh, we put together in uh, in August and September, we were talking about the new Qatar of of, of energy here. That the, the fact that is it's actually a net relevant scenario is because Guyana is a fairly small country with only 780,000 inhabitants, so very small. Uh, it's definitely the, the new findings in, in energy is going to be you know completely changing the structure of the economy of the country, and and we're seeing and facing with a with a key challenges of development and infrastructure, finding uh, you know relevant uh, resources and human resources for for working on, on those fields and, and all, all these issues actually make it very relevant to look at what had happened in Qatar like 15 years ago uh, of, of how you know these this defining of natural gas in the case of Qatar uh, actually just completely changed the structure of the, of the country itself um, in in recent news uh, in, in Guyana I mean we have probably for your listeners it might be interesting just to put a, a few numbers on the table here we had talked uh, in last interviews of the 120,000 barrels per day uh, which are supposed to be uh, you know um, first produced starting Q1 of next year already but when you're actually looking at the, at, the, at the potential of the country itself and even in the short term we're not talking about 120,000 barrels a day we're actually talking about 270,000 barrels a day uh, which is probably you know two three more times that you know times more than what Trinidad and Tobago did at its peak in the 1970s that's really showing you the importance of, of Guyana on the regional scene in terms of energy production and those numbers of 270,000 barrels a day put it like as a as a key player in, in, in world energy output. The reason why we have this gap between 120,000 barrels and 270,000 barrels is that you know we're actually expecting that new finds uh, will come on stream and will add those 220,000 barrels per day uh, on, on uh, those 150,000 barrels per day in around 2022. So those production in 2020 with first oil being produced in the next coming month uh, will then be followed up by a series of of, of, of adding up of, of production, especially because Exxon already has as confirmed additional fines last month. Uh, Talo is another player that has also come from new fines uh, in, in the um, in the same region. You also have other players such as Repsol that are very active. So the uh, the, the recent discovery, the discovery that already talks about uh, from Excel of this 120,000 barrels a day starting next year will actually be followed up by, by a series of additional production from other players, uh, thus making it even more, even more important to understand Guyana and the potential that it has in terms of, of oil production and the impact that it will have in terms of needs of infrastructure and, and the structuring of, of, of energy companies or logistics companies that will, you know, invest in the countries in the couple of coming weeks and months. Okay, and so ExxonMobil is obviously a, a very large American company. Where are the other companies coming from? Are they mostly American and European, or are they from all over? Well, they're fairly from all over. When mostly, obviously, uh, Western companies because of the uh, of the history, recent history of, of of Guyana. But you do have Talo that is there. You have Repsol, also that's a Spanish company, uh, also invested there. You do have regional players uh, from Trinidad, Tobago, more onto onto other other sectors of, of, of the energy production and transformation that are very much invested in uh, in in Guyana. Um, this uh, the, the the panel of of companies. Involved in Guyana makes it, you know, the, the you know the potential for business very interesting in, in the country because you actually are going to see uh, 
the investment from a series of different actors that used to be working with with Talo, with Repsol, with Exxon, and other countries, and invest in 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 Guyana at the time. That we have also uh, players from Canada and uh, and a joint venture with the, with the Chinese companies that has been uh, you know present for a couple of years already in uh, in um, in Guyana. But when you're looking at the situation of Guyana compared to uh, let's say Suriname or other or Venezuela, uh, the presence of of Chinese investors or Russian investors is much you know, lesser compared to, to Guyana, which is very much more open for business with American and European companies, as as uh, and Australian also actors as their main partners for the, for the you know uh, exploration, production, and transformation of oil in the country. And that's very much has to do with the uh, current political situation. And we probably will talk a little later of the upcoming elections. But you have a, 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 an administration that is led by President Granger for the last three years that has actually been very um, cautious about the way uh, and the partners that that were selected for uh, for developments in the country. Exxon has been the historical partner of the of the of the country also in terms of exploration rights. Uh, but you see a very responsible approach to uh, selecting partners, but also to managing the funds that would be generating through the production of of the uh, of oil uh, in the country with a, a development of national reserve funds that is very much following the the the, the, the structure of the sovereign wealth funds that you seen in, in Norway and other responsible um, energy players around the world, uh, trying to avoid as much as possible the uh, the oil curse or Dutch disease impact on, on the rest of the economy in, in the country, which is right now one of the poorest country in, in, in the Western Hemisphere. Okay, and so I'd really like to get back to uh, those points just a bit later, but for now, I suppose this plays into the uh, sort of the, the political situation there, but are there any signs that uh, Guyana would be interested in joining a group like OPEC, or is it for the most part very close to the West? And and just, uh, just thinking about um, uh, OPEC for a second, so if Ghana were to be producing 270 barrels per day, just in context, that would make it uh, the the third, fourth smallest oil producer in OPEC, if it were a member. So that's just to give a little bit of context for how much oil it could be producing. It would be right up there with uh, one of the one of the major oil producing groups in the world. So I suppose a, a question to come from that is we've spoken previously about uh, Ghana heading heading towards uh, a, a Chinese interest or heading towards Western interest is is what are we thinking of the current direction that the company that the country is headed in? Well, r right now there's there's no talks of Guyana joining joining OPEC. I mean, mm -hmm. there's this there's the development of of the energy industry in Guyana has been very much made you know hand in hand with a. Uh, with Exxon and other American actors, the government is very strongly, you know, advised by different European banks in the in the in the you know transfer the, the putting together of a sovereign wealth funds and and trying to manage the uh, uh, you know the the wall policy in terms of the impact it has on fiscal spending and how to invest it into you know critical social and infrastructure needs across the country. Uh, the, the the way that it's it's developed, the way that you're seeing starting to see the different actors, uh, you know, uh, operating in Guyana in terms of, of policy making, in terms of of, of strategy for for channeling uh, um, let's say uh, new revenues for investment is not is not the traditional uh, play that that OPEC members have and then that that's not something that is currently on the on the agenda for Guyana now if obviously if, if you had um, uh, in, in the upcoming elections the uh, the return of the PPP so the indo-caribbean um, uh, party uh, back into 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 office then the uh, the the very much pro west uh, stance of the uh, um, of the new AFC uh, coalition right now might actually just you know be questioned and and there might be additional new strategies in terms of what would be you know the geopolitical alliances that uh, that Guyana might might put together with other actors and maybe with other countries uh, but as as of today and if you know this uh, current administration were to be you know um, have a new mandate after the upcoming elections you would probably see Guyana you know stick with its uh, its strategies of, of of working as as a Caribbean actors inside CARICOM and as a as a member of the Western Hemisphere outside of OPEC structure and working with foreign investment from you know uh, Western majors in in uh, across the across the economy and and, and the country today. Um, just as, as a reminder, we are in a situation where, you know, the Granger administration 
was enjoying a very short majority in Congress until mid last year, uh, just one seat difference uh, that that allowed it to uh, to rule the the the, the country. Uh, that uh, the change in when when one of the uh, of the congressmen actually did not vote the uh, the confidence to the government, and there were you know some uh, allegation that of corruption that made him potentially have his vote swung to the to the opposition. So this is still ongoing with a, a current investigation. But as a result, uh, we do have a situation where the the government is in is in office without any enjoying a support from the parliament and without having enjoyed a, a, a vote of confidence. And so as a, as a constitutional rule, there should have been elections already in Guyana uh, to, uh, to see where, you know, to just form a new government and new majority in Congress. This has not happened yet uh, for a series of reasons. First of all, as I said, these corruption allegations were put, uh, you know, put in the uh, uh, investigated to try to see if you know this change of majority was something that you know should be revisited, uh, and and also because of a series of institutional blockage inside even the uh, um, the authority organizing elections and so on. This is now being settled, uh, and there's talks of having the uh, the the elections before the end of this year. And as I said, I mean this uh, the traditional antagonism between the Afro Caribbean. Uh, AFCF New Coalition and the Indo Caribbean PPP uh, party will probably decide uh, the, uh, the 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 future in terms of alliances being you know signed between Guyana and India or China or Russia or on the other side with Guyana staying uh, inside the, uh, the 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 Western um, influence. But even even if PPP the PPP were to actually uh, uh, come back to power, uh, I think there's a growing understanding inside Guyana that the way that the uh, the uh, Grand Jury administration has managed the uh, the uh, arrival of new revenues and, and has had a very let's say responsible approach to developing a sovereign wealth funds, so making sure that there's no uh, or limited impact of uh, Dutch disease-like impact on, on the economy is something that has been rec recognized. Um, but, you know, there's also a, a strong uh, expectations from the population that is waiting for those new revenues I and mean, these, these dates of 2020, 2021, uh, arrival of, of, of new important revenues is something that has created a lot of, in, of expectation and impatience among the population for the economy to be, uh, to be boosted and, and benefiting from it. Okay, and so just on the uh, the general election, so according to the uh, Guyanese leader, the election would be held on the 2nd of March in 2020, but as you've just said, that it, it could well be before the end of the year. Um, and uh, for viewers, uh, the footage of the response in Parliament of the vote of no confidence is very, very interesting to see. Um, they were clearly not expecting to lose that vote. And so I suppose that we'll, uh, we'll, we'll touch back on uh, what you've mentioned, the uh, Dutch disease, this uh, dependence on oil. So what sort of strategy is the government currently seeking to avoid the country being dependent on oil in a few years down the track? So when I, when I think of countries that want don't want to be in that situation uh, my mind immediately goes to a country like uh, saudi arabia or the united arab emirates which have in the past few years been scrambling to diversify their economies but guyana doesn't even have any oil production yet and they're already thinking long term what can you tell me about what they're thinking about well, first of all, I mean, you're looking at the history of Guyana and the way, the way that it has tried to design its its economy and its strategies in terms of, of new economic policy. You you have to command a series of, of, of different approaches that were that were taken recently. Um, I mean, even when you're looking at and you're talking about a country which is fairly underdeveloped compared to its neighbors, uh, was relying on already a history of natural resources with gold mining, especially as being one you know key sector of the economy. Uh, but also with a key interest of trying to protect uh, the Amazonian forest and trying to protect the environment. So as a result, uh, when you're looking back a decade ago, there was this, an agreement signed between Guyana and Norway uh, from up to $50 million, if I'm not wrong, of protecting the, uh, the Amazonian forest uh, 
and, and limiting deforestation, uh, while there might have been a, a, an interest in, in developing new mining projects uh, that are unsustainable in case of the administration in power would have been you know, less reasonable in its, in its approach to the economy. So you do have already uh, a philosophy in Guyana of, of understanding uh, the, the issues of, of extractive industries and sustainability and trying to make sure that there, there's other, other sources of revenues that will not only be linked to, uh, to ex the extractive industry. Now, uh, that is to say that the, 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 this tradition from Guyana um, and this already, uh, let's say, base case practices from the history has been a, a strong ally in trying to, you know, shaping the perception from, uh, from government members. Um, the arrival of, uh, uh, of huge revenues from the oil sector obviously as, as creating a lot of expectations, but immediately the objective was to create, as I said, the sovereign wealth funds called National Reserve Fund um, that actually... Um, the idea would that all revenues would actually go directly into that 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 sovereign wealth fund, which is offshore today, and and there would be a fiscal transfer rule uh, to the budget, uh, usually around three percent of the NRF, uh, that would therefore limit the creation of uh, bubbles and 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 inflation, then leading to the, the resource curve that we've seen in so many countries. Um, the objective is definitely to have a fiscal balance that will be constrained to zero, uh, but that transfer to the NRF will actually be limited uh, to this no all fiscal deficit level, and therefore not leading to uh, to a creation of bubbles or, or, or you know crushing of the other sectors of the economy. A lot of work has actually been done already to try to to limit you know negative externalities of. Uh, of the, the obviously inflation or uh, costs inside the countries of, of you know with higher wages or, or so on to other sectors. I mean, there's the agricultural sector is is one that has had a, a strong um, presence in the uh, in Guyana, especially with sugar industry or other industries such as the rice industry. So all these are very well constituted, and there's been a very responsible approach from the government to try to to see how to protect other sector of the economy just so that if even if the uh, if the energy sector is going to be obviously a very a very uh, by far the largest sector in the economy in the coming decades and, and and later that you still have a maintaining of other you know levels of diversification in the Guyanese economy um, key problems that you're going to have in Guyana in, into uh, in, in in the short run even is is probably the need to improve infrastructure the need to improve the supply of skilled labor that's something that you have um, a worry that you already had in Guyana with uh, when when once once one was looking at the development of of the mining sector and being able to have you know skilled workers for the mining industry and this is going to be even more important with the development of of the uh, of the energy sector. Um, Guyana has already uh, has an history of attracting high level of immigration uh, over the last twenty years, but this is still mostly from unskilled labor, uh, and so there's there's going to be a key. A challenge of making sure uh, that uh, there are training programs put in place, that there are, and we're talking about training programs even from you know basic level of accounting uh, to uh, specialized workforce into uh, into engineering. There's there's a very strong challenge and and and, uh, and um, strategy that needs to be put in place, and and maybe uh, with uh, with much more capacity to implement best case practices internationally uh, to incentivize people for training themselves and, and also having the large Guyanese diaspora, which is very much present in New York, in Toronto specifically, and London also, to come back to the country and, and, and contribute to the, to the development of, of, the, of the local economy and the local you know, knowledge basis and capital and, and, work for, um, and uh, intellectual capital so that you actually have a, a strongly maintained and long-term benefits for the country through the uh, through the energy sector. Okay, and so I think that we will leave our chat there just touching on the challenges that Ghana faces going forward. Thank you so much for taking the time to have a chat with me, Remy. That was great. That was a pleasure. And that was Remy Piet, Senior Director at America's Market Intelligence. I'm Scott Tibbles with the Investing News Network you can find us at investingnews.com and feel free to follow us at Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Thanks for listening.